the next topic we're going to talk about is systemic therapy for hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. And maybe we'll start with the most aggressive form, the de novo metastatic hormone sensitive disease. How, how do you all approach those cases in terms of selecting therapy? Yes, so I always I struggle um, in community when we are seeing variety, but uh, whenever I see a de novo metastatic prostate cancer coming, I just saw a patient a week ago, had a PSA 500, had a bony lesions, had a, um, uh, we get the PSMA PET, we get a, you know, visceral med. So is that the way I can, uh, we make a decision in community is high volume, low volume. And uh, if it's a high volume disease, I tend to go more a triplet therapy. Um, and if it's a low volume, then we still have to have a discussion with the patients. I, at that time, I look at the patient's performance status, age, um, and, and the clear understanding of the goals of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but that's uh, how I start. But I'm very curious to know with all this data and pretty much every AR agonist, how you, how, uh, um, you use this data and to your patients. Yeah, um, so uh, we do something similar. I do something similar in my practice, looking at high volume, looking at low volume disease, the Arison's data, the PEACE-1 data, adding triplet therapy um, to ADT and ARSI, and adding docetaxel to those patients. Um, in those who are a low volume disease, really picking between the two, and similarly with regards to the Arison's and PEACE, Nubeca, abiraterone. If they're, you know, low volume, how are you picking between enzalutamide, apalutamide, abiraterone? Really then it's talking to the patient side effect profile. Do you have a history of falls, seizures? I'm less likely to choose something like enzalutamide. I know we're going to talk about some new data with hormone sensitive and daralutamide and ADT, um, but really side effect profiles and um, discussions with the patients. Technically, you know, ADT by itself is sometimes a consideration if you have someone with a lot of comorbidities. Um, so, so I think it's very, very, it's about treating the patient in front of you um, is how I, how I see it. We can just go around the room. What percentage of your patients with charted high volume disease do you end up treating with docetaxel in this setting? I would say 30 to like 30 to 40%. I would treat with the triplet. Mm -hmm. um, the other patients, I offer ADT plus ARSI alone because of age, comorbidities, um, not, they don't want chemotherapy, they'd like to avoid it at all costs because of what they've heard from, about chemotherapy. And also we know from Arison's, right, that it was ADT plus daralutamide plus docetaxel versus ADT plus docetaxel. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an overall survival benefit with the triplet compared to ADT plus docetaxel, but we don't have that trial of the triplet, ADT plus ARSI plus docetaxel, compared to ADT plus ARSI. So we don't know if the OS benefit is being driven by um, you know, the ARSI alone. It's very mm -hmm. possible that it is, and, or, or that the triplet is, you know, there's some sort of synergy there. But I think without, without a head-to-head -head trial of the triplet versus, AD, uh, the triplet versus ADT plus ARSI, um, it's hard for me to tell patients that you have to go for the triplet. Mm -hmm. yep. And if they're young, like if they're in their 50s and they have metastatic de novo prostate cancer, and like I'm worried that, and I really want to do everything I can to, you know, uh, expand their overall survival. If they have metastatic disease but a low PSA, that's like, is there some, you know, bad bad tumor features mm -hmm. here going on? Then then I'll add the triplet, um, high volume disease, visceral mets. Uh, specifically liver mets, and then I also look at tumor NGS. So mm -hmm. um, if they have two out of three uh, mutations in tumor suppressor genes, P10, RB1, TP53, then I am suggesting like, let's go for the, the docetaxel because this is maybe not like bread and butter prostate cancer. This is yeah. looking a little bit more aggressive. The biology is more scary. Yeah, I, I think I agree with the maybe 30 to 50% <clears throat> estimate. And I think part of that is you know, driven by me and part of that is driven by the patient. As you said, a lot of patients don't want to get chemotherapy. And um, there's also a wide range, I think, within high volume disease, right? There's mm -hmm. patients who have visceral disease, 
and then um, you know to have um, what is it four uh, four more bone lesions with one outside the one axial point. skeleton I mean I think it's very different for someone to have you know four lesions that fit that criteria versus a super scan um, on bone scan so yeah. um, I think within high volume disease there is that degree of variation too yeah I agree it's it, the high, it it seems to perform very well looking at, I was looking back this morning at the meta-analysis of Stampede, Charted, and Zetug, and they all showed that, but it's still a pretty, that four metastasis with one outside the axial skeleton, it's, it's not like BRCA2, you have it or not, it's a mechanistic black and white difference. It's, it's, we know that there's, it's, it's, a, it's a rough estimate that we're gauging and there's gonna be people who are gonna perform differently than the cutoff. And there are, I agree that the, the people that you might, who are on the borderline that you might treat with chemotherapy are exactly what you mentioned, the young people with unfavorable, unfavorable factors that I might, even a few low volume people, technically low volume, for example, people with bulky lymphadenopathy, they weren't really studied directly in those three yeah, studies sure. as a separate group, but technically they're low volume, but they have a lot of cancer in their body and maybe even though they're gonna probably do well with lymph node only, it seems like there's a lot of cancer there to, to treat. Yeah, and in the Arisense trial, there was an OS benefit, even in the low volume um, subset. They, they, there was in the entire population that they looked at high volume, low volume, and there was an over, yeah. uh, overall survival benefit. So it's not wrong to do it, mm -hmm. but, uh, but yeah, you could potentially spare docetaxel and, 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 and we still know that ADT plus ARSI backbone works very, very well for many patients. So, in, and in terms of triple A therapy, we, uh, as I recall, there are, you know, data for two agents, as you know, RB Pred, uh, with doxetaxel, and now dalutamide. How you tend to, uh, because as we know, doxetaxel can affect liver function tests, so do you tend to add the agent by second cycle? How we are using in the practice? Um, you know, uh, granted, you know, we do have sometimes takes a time for payer to, you know, cover it and so forth, but uh, all those uh, things aside, are you uh, try to you, uh, add by second cycle, third cycle, how you are approaching in your practice? Uh, at least for me, I mean, I, when I meet them, I'm sending off authorizations for kind of everything. Um, you know, we have certain pharmacies that we work with that can get folks drug quickly. Um, and then the decision between Aberato and Nubeca um, or, or Teralutamide, um, you know, oftentimes is, do I trust you to come every two weeks for LFT checks for the first three months? Is that something that I think you're going to do? Um, you know, it comes down to, to blood pressure, the mild leukopenias, you know, a little bit of GI upset and talking through them. And it's a lot of patient centric decision making. But, you know, oftentimes we are able to procure these drugs pretty quickly. I've, I've gotten abiraterone and prednisone within a few days with a, with a certain pharmacy. Um, and even even darolutamide we're getting quite quickly. Similarly with ADT, even if we're going with something like Orgovix Lupron, we can get quickly, Docetax, so we can get quickly. Um, but even Orgovix now, we can we can procure pretty quickly. So um, I kind of get everything in tandem. There's some people where I will see how they do if they're a little bit marginal in terms of their functional status. I may see how they do on enhanced mm -hmm. ADT for, and I think in charted, they had up to 12 weeks to register. Yes. So I'll see how they do the first couple months and if they're if I'm really worried about chemotherapy I might even uh, as to what Dr. Wong said about the, the swag studies with the PSA I might uh, there's not really data directly for this but see if at three months their PSA is undetectable already I may feel less of a need to add the docetaxel in a marginal patient than if their PSA is only down by 50 percent at that point. Yeah, I agree with that, like in a sort of an adaptive approach where you're yeah. starting with the, I mean, in the majority of cases, if we're making the commitment to go with triplet therapy, I, like Dr. Kelly, just order it all and get mm -hmm. started with whatever I can as soon as possible. Um, but, but if they're kind of on the fence about the docetaxel component, and I can start with the ADT plus RSI backbone, and I, I like to look at PSA, and again, the PSA of less than 0.2 at six months has been like actually in all the registrational tri trials, Arches and Titan and Arisons and Peace uh, One was shown to be 
associated with overall survival benefit. So if they're kind of their PSA is going down a little sluggishly and they're not getting to that like 0.2 and three to six months, I think it's reasonable mm -hmm. if the patient is still motivated to think about adding the docetaxel. Um, so it's, yeah, it can be done all at once or a sort of a more adaptive approach, I think. Mm -hmm.